Hello, Tor Lacey here with a lecture on plate tectonics. Plate tectonics, what is it? Let's consider the words that make up the name, plate and tectonics. Like much of the vocabulary in the earth sciences, the name is rather self-explanatory. The first word, plate, refers to an individual piece of the lithosphere, which we call a plate. The second word, tectonics, refers to the assembling of the structure of the lithosphere. In other words, how the lithosphere is put together. Why does plate tectonics happen? Earth is unique in our solar system in that it is the only planetary body we know of that has active plate tectonics. So why is this the case? Well, Earth's core is still very hot, about as hot as the surface of the sun. The heat that is perpetually rising from the core is trying to escape into space, but Earth's rigid outer shell, the lithosphere, acts as a barrier. But this barrier is only so strong, so eventually the rising heat splits the lithosphere apart through a process called rifting, and the heat escapes. Plates. The rifting has caused the lithosphere to be broken up into about 20 pieces, which we call plates, or more formally, lithospheric plates or tectonic plates. Consider a hard-boiled egg that is a cracked shell. An individual piece of the shell is a plate. So that would be a plate, 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 while the line of contact between two plates is a plate boundary. The squishy white of the hard-boiled egg beneath the lithosphere is comparable to the asthenosphere. Unlike the pieces of shell around the egg, though, the lithospheric plates are in constant motion around the Earth. This tectonic process creates the structure of the crust and is driven by heat rising up from Earth's very hot core. The heat rises in the form of convection currents. So in the video here, what we have is a pot of boiling oats. You see that the oats are not just statically sitting there, but instead are swirling around. The heat from the flames at the bottom of the pan causes the water to expand and rise up to the top where it cools and then sinks back down. And through this process, you create a circular current that takes the oats along with it. Plate tectonics. To review, this is a theory that Earth's rigid outer shell, the lithosphere, is broken up into individual pieces called plates. These move and interact with one another along plate boundaries, driving Earth's constructive geologic processes and controlling the structure of the crust. From a historic standpoint, this relatively young explanation for the workings of Earth is comparable to the theory of evolution in biology or the theory of relativity in physics, because it caused a major shift among all Earth scientists in our understanding of the physical Earth and how it evolves over time. In this way, the theory of plate tectonics represents a paradigm shift. So how did the grand unifying theory of plate tectonics come to be? What do people believe before this idea came along? While it might seem hard to believe now, it was thought that Earth and the continents and oceans that make up its surface formed at some time in the past, maybe as recently as 6,000 years ago. And since that time, have remained relatively unchanged. The seed that became plate tectonics was planted about 100 years ago by Alfred Wegener and the continental drift hypothesis. Alfred Wegener was an earth scientist that lived from 1880 to 1930. He brought a relatively obscure idea into the mainstream that the continents had once been joined and since that time have drifted apart. In the spirit of the scientific method, this bold notion was tested through collecting data by scientists that both embraced and doubted this hypothesis. It had long been noted 
that the shapes of continents on opposite sides of the Atlantic Ocean matched up. Vector used data to show that they had by matching the edges of the continental shelves. This was significant because the edge of the continental shelf, the portion of the continent that is below sea level, represents the true edge of the continent. So in this figure here, the light blue part is the portion of the continent that is below sea level. The edge of that is the continental shelf. And you see that they match up quite well. The small gaps are the result of 200 million years of erosion, while the little areas of overlap represent sediments that have uh, been deposited from the continents. So if you factor those two things in, they essentially fit together perfectly. He also showed that rocks of the same type and age, as well as mountains, can be found on continents separated by the Atlantic. So the purple Archean crust are rock of the same age that match up. And then we have matching uh, mountain belts across the Atlantic in North America, Africa, Europe, and Greenland. In Wegner's words, the match was so complete, it was comparable to reading a newspaper that had been torn in half and you couldn't complete the sentence. And then you found the other half of the newspaper on the other side of the Atlantic, put the piece of newspaper together, and then you could continue reading. Let's now look at evidence from ancient climate patterns. Today there are coal deposits that formed in ancient swamps, ancient sand dunes, salt deposits, corals preserved as rock, as well as glaciated rock, distributed in a pattern that only makes sense if you move the continents to different locations. So we see on this illustration here, this band of coal swamps. These form near the equator. Today, these are preserved as coal deposits in places, say, like in eastern North America, which is far from the equator. But if North America had once existed near the equator, you could form coal swamps that became the coal deposits that I just referred to. Similarly, we have uh, ancient sand dunes preserved in rock. Sand dunes also form near the equator. Think of uh, the Sahara Desert, for example. Today, places like Utah, which, are, which is far from the equator, have ancient sand dunes preserved in rock. But they would be, it would be impossible to make sand dunes of that size in Utah today. But if North America was closer to the equator where those sand dunes could have formed, then it is possible. Here in South America, Africa, India, and Australia, we have rock that shows evidence of glaciation, meaning that they have been scraped by glaciers that flowed over them at one time. Well, these places are too far from Antarctica today to have formed. Uh, glaciers. But if we move them around Antarctica at some time in the past, then it would have been cold enough there for glaciers to form and flow over those parts of the continents. So this is more solid evidence to support that the continents have drifted from a colder location in the past, or a warmer location in the past. So with all of this evidence and more that was left out of this lecture, why did Wegener's hypothesis not become a theory? Well, the answer is he couldn't explain how the continents move. Unfortunately, he nor anyone else at that time had a complete understanding of the structure of the Earth. There wasn't a notion of a lithosphere or a senosphere, let alone tectonic plates. Without that data, Wegener devised explanations for the movements of the continents that did not stand up to scientific scrutiny. So when he died at the age of 50, his hypothesis died with him. Resurrecting Wegener's Hypothesis of Continental Drift World War II was a terrible thing, but it did bring about new technologies which have been helpful, including a better understanding of the workings of Earth. One such technology was sonar, which allowed us to map the seafloor. Let's consider this video from your lecture textbook reading.
Assuming that you have watched the video, it seems that earthquake locations provide information about the workings of Earth and plate tectonics, with the locations of mountain ranges both on the continents and along the sea floor, coinciding with the edges of lithospheric plates, which are called plate boundaries. The pattern of red dots on this illustration here essentially traces out the locations of plate boundaries. This map here shows the locations of these plate boundaries perhaps more clearly. The key here gives us fracture zone, mid-ocean ridge, and deep ocean trench. We'll expand on these as we go through the lecture further. Where two plates meet and interact, we call this a plate boundary. There are three types of plate boundaries. Divergent, convergent, and transform. Divergent plate boundaries mark the location of two plates moving away or diverging from one another. When both plates are oceanic, the process of seafloor spreading makes new ocean crust. While pushing the two plates away from each other, as well as continents that might be parts of those plates. South America and Africa, for example. So here we have the map view perspective with our divergent boundary here. And then we see the same thing here in cross section, the divergent boundary there, and then each plate being pushed in opposite directions. This process also provides evidence that plate tectonics is happening because we find the youngest crust along the rift valley of the mid-ocean ridge and progressively older crusts the farther we are away from the plate boundary. The only reasonable explanation for this pattern is that magma rises up as the seafloor rifts apart, filling in the gap and solidifying as new basaltic ocean floor. This rock is then split in two as each plate moves away. A great place to see a divergent boundary on land is Iceland, which I had the good fortune of visiting with my son a few years ago. So in the photograph here, this side here is the North American plate, and here is the rift valley that has formed uh, along the divergent boundary between North America on this side and the Eurasian plate uh, off the photograph to the right. We zoom in here, myself and my son, and this is what it would look like if you're down along this path that puts you right in the Rift Valley. This photograph here is significant in that we are able to literally walk in the Rift Valley between the North American plate and the Eurasian plate. Rifting also happens within continental lithosphere through a process called continental rifting. This process can lead to the crust eventually splitting into two pieces as a new plate boundary is formed. So in the illustration here, we see time as we go from A to B to C to D. Continental rifting occurs where plate motions produce opposing tensional forces that thin the, thin the lithosphere and promote upwelling of the mantle. So earlier in the lecture, you might recall that um, the reason that Earth has plate tectonics is because the core is very hot. This rising heat needs to escape somewhere. Here the rising heat is trying to escape through the continent, and over time the heat is working on the underside of the lithosphere, causing it to uh, get hotter, weaker and stretch apart. Eventually, given enough time, tens of millions of time, tens of millions of years of time, it stretches to the point that it literally breaks into two pieces and you form a new plate boundary. Two plates collide along convergent boundaries, where one or both plates are oceanic crust, then the process of subduction occurs. Subduction destroys the old oceanic crust, 
On the other hand, subduction generates magma, which rises up to Earth's surface to make a line of volcanoes parallel to the trench called a volcanic arc. When two continental plates are colliding, subduction ceases since the crust on both plates is too buoyant to subduct. Prior to the development of the theory of plate tectonics, we didn't have a complete understanding as to why volcanoes occur where they do. But now, as we can see in the illustration here, the magma being generated by subduction rises up to the Earth's surface, creating this line of volcanoes parallel to the trench. So everywhere we have trenches, we have these lines of volcanoes. So there's a clear connection between the two, giving us an explanation as to why volcanoes occur where they do on Earth. Where two plates are sliding horizontally past one another, without crust being created or destroyed, we have a transform boundary. Almost all transform boundaries occur on the seafloor and play an important role in allowing seafloor spreading to occur at different rates along a mid-ocean ridge. In a few cases, though, transform faults cut across continents where they can pose a significant earthquake hazard, such as the San Andreas Fault in California, being a great example of a transform boundary and transform fault. Constructive geologic processes. Constructive geologic processes. These are processes that build up the topography and add new rock to Earth's crust and are partially responsible for the continual renewal of Earth's relatively young surface. The constructive forces are generated along divergent and convergent plate boundaries. Along divergent boundaries, sea floor spreading continually adds new oceanic crust, building up the ocean floor, or builds new mountains on land. While along convergent plate boundaries, subduction generates magma, rises to Earth's surface to form intrusive or extrusive igneous rock. If two continental crust plates collide, the crust is pushed up to make mountains. In either case, Earth's surface is being built up and or new rock is being added. This illustration gives us a nice cross-sectional perspective of plate boundaries, and the action of plate tectonics. It also shows us a hotspot. Hotspots, like the name implies, are spots on Earth where it's hot. More specifically, hotspots mark the location on the crust where extra heat rising from the core as a plume or column melts rock in the lithosphere to make magma, which rises up to make volcanoes. Along with divergent and convergent boundaries, hotspots are the only places on Earth where magma rises up to Earth's surface to make volcanoes. Hotspots also provide evidence of plate tectonics. For example, the Hawaiian Islands are an archipelago, or a line of volcanoes, that grew to above sea level to make islands. The only island with active volcanoes is the Big Island of Hawaii, which is sitting on the hotspot. The other volcanoes of the other islands, Maui, Oahu, Molokai, and Kauai, are all extinct because they have been moved off the hotspot as the Pacific Plate has moved to the north. So that's it. Thank you for listening. Hopefully you enjoyed this lecture. There, are, there is more two plate tectonics that you're going to be picking up from your reading and your uh, laboratory assignments.